Bold Venture. Hi, everyone. This is Joe Webb. I've been collecting radio programs since my teens. And one of the things that has always been interesting to me has been series like Bold Venture. And with us today is Carl Amari, who has also been a collector and also started the business Radio Spirits many years ago, which he sold in 1998 and is still involved in our hobby with the Hollywood 360 show on weekends, which is broadcast nationally and people can stream around the world. And also with us today is Doug Hopkinson, who is a collector for many, many years, but Doug is also an expert in transferring radio transcriptions. He has the task of transferring uh, these Bold Venture discs that Carl has gotten the rights to make them available through a Kickstarter program. Carl, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how this got started, and then I'd like to add something about why Bold Venture is important when you're done. Sure. Thanks, Joe, for having me on the show. I have been a, a huge fan of these classic radio shows ever since I was a teenager, I think 12 years old when I first got hooked on these shows. I always loved Bold Venture. I love Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall. I was always really enamored with uh, this guy, Frederick Zip, who was so ahead of his time, who produced so many incredible radio shows, because my favorite radio show is Boston Blackie, and that was one that he syndicated. How he got Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, two of the biggest stars in the world at the time in the 50s, early 50s, to star in a radio series is a fascinating story, one that I was always really interested in. The fact that there's maybe 50 plus shows in circulation and different variants in sound, but there has always been about 18 shows missing. And I found out maybe five years ago that all the Bold Ventures and all the rest of the Ziv material is in Cincinnati in a temperature controlled warehouse uh, that Frederick Ziv donated to Media Heritage. We license these from Media Heritage, which is a 501c3. Any revenue and royalties that we can pay, not only through the Kickstarter, but in selling these after the Kickstarter, will go to their broadcast university. So that's that's part of the preservation effort to help to help them. And so there's over 10,000 discs at this broadcast university. And so I've been trying to license it for a long, long time. So now it's finally possible. So you've come to an agreement with them. And the first program that's going to be released this way is Bold Venture. And I've seen some pictures of the discs that uh, Doug has sent me, and they look absolutely gorgeous. And even the transcription sleeves look like they haven't been touched in decades upon <laughs> decades. There's not even a, a single dog ear corner <laughs> of them. The sound on these discs from the samples that I've heard is really quite incredible. Doug, maybe you can go through how basically you've just had to clean the discs and uh, not have to do much processing on them. Really, there's no processing to be done uh, at all. They, they are so clean, especially after you put them in the ultrasonic cleaner and rinse them in the ultrasonic cleaner. They come out sparkling and squeaky clean. These discs were Ziv's personal copies, so they were never played. As we all know, being in this hobby, how we have a lot of these shows is because these discs were bicycled around to radio stations and they got nicked up and beat up. And we have them today, 70 years later, and they are um, pretty scratchy a lot of times. But these were taken right off the duplicator and put in a sleeve and put on a shelf. There's over 10,000 discs like that, not just Bold Venture, Boston Blackie, I Was a Communist for the FBI, Favorite Story, The Easy Aces, Mr. District Attorney with David Bryan, Cisco Kid. And these are in absolute pristine sound. And not only pristine sound, but all the missing episodes are there too. Bold Venture is a really incredible series because... It has Bogart and Bacall at a time when television is starting to get a lot of interest. And here they are, two of the biggest stars in Hollywood, wanting to do a radio program. What a lot of people forget is that television was just starting. 1948 was a key year in the history of television with the tremendous sales of television sets. But only 9% of households had a television, which means 91% did not. And there wasn't much to watch. And to do a television program every week would have been very challenging for the Bogarts because they still had a film career going and they were starting their family. 
And then Frederick Ziv comes and says, look, we can accommodate all these kinds of things and we will be able to continue the recognition of your names and your persona through radio. And he started to arrange different schedules for them. They were able to do uh, recordings when they could. They were able to do segments of, of recordings on tape that could then be further produced with other actors and the like. So they really liked this idea. And they also like the idea that, that Ziv was offering them so much money for this. Not only that too, Joe, but Ziv said to them, we'll create a show around whatever you want. They brought in David uh, Friedkin, Morton Fine, David Friedkin, who two of the best writers of radio. They all kind of huddled together and Bogey and Bacall got to decide what the show was. That was the other thing that I don't know that they were ever offered prior. Some fans may not know who Fine and Friedkin were but you can hear their work on Broadway is my beat and the lineup. And, and some of the Broadway is my beat show have absolute poetry at yes. the beginning of their shows. So you had superb writers and you're going to have continuity across the episodes because they're writing all the episodes. Basically, right. it's not a freelancer popping in every now and then. They announced this sometime in the fall of 1950 and around Christmas time, 1950, they start recording programs because the Bogarts have a deadline. Humphrey has to go to Europe and to Africa to start filming The African Queen. So they're putting together shows and they wanted to have 36 shows done before uh, they had to go. And they were able to do it. And in the meantime, while they're gone, they're still working on the production. And the show was actually first broadcast from what I can, can determine on March 26, 1951. That was the date contractually that the, that the stations could start uh, playing it. So they're away doing all, all this film work. And in the meantime, America's hearing them while they have basically no film out. So this had to be tremendous publicity for them. Right. And they were on more stations than any one network could provide. If you were on CBS, they might have been on 300 stations. But I think they were on over 500 stations right. by syndicating it. So it was even a wider audience than an NBC or a CBS or a Mutual mm -hmm. could offer. One thing Ziv could do is he could go to stations no matter what their affiliation was because right. they always had time to yeah. acquire other programs for their geography. Right. Yes. And Bogart and Bacall were sought after for decades, you know, or at least Humphrey Bogart was to be the star of a regular radio show. And he always turned it down. And as they got busier and they wanted to start their family and wanted to travel more, this fit them perfectly. Tell us about the Kickstarter program. You're trying to reach, what is it, $78,000? <laughs> 70, I think it's $70,000, 70,800. Okay. I think we're going to be able to, if we get through this and we put Boston Blackie up next, I think it's going to be a little less. We've kind of got our sea legs on this thing now. That's what it ended up being when you add the licensing fee to ship them, the taxes, the Kickstarter fees, and the transfer fee. That's right. about what it costs. They have to be professionally transferred and cleaned and you know all that kind of stuff, which Doug is doing. What I've heard from the few episodes he's done, it's like they're standing next to you. You can hear them breathing. A lot of yeah. people forget that AM radio didn't sound all that good. When you hear recordings like this, you can detect all kinds of uh, things. And there, there's a fuller range of sound that anybody than anybody heard in that era on their car radio or their home radio. We're asking people to help us get it all transferred. That's the cost it's going to be when you add all those fees in. If we do, if we're successful, then we're going to move on to Boston Blackie. Mm -hmm. And we'll do it in three batches. We'll do about 72 episodes per batch. And uh, I don't think we'll be at 70. I think we'll be close, like in the 50 range. The goal here is to get through Bold Venture. When you pledge, of course, the way Kickstarter works, it does not ding your card unless we hit the goal. If we do, then mm -hmm. we're going to give these shows to the people that pledged. Different levels of pledges gets you either the entire collection digitally or on 39 CDs or less if you pledge less. Right. And part of the reason to pledge less is if, if you can't handle the, the 78 episodes and the, and the fees associated with that, you're at least contributing to the cause of preserving right. these particular programs. You'll get some anyway, yeah. Ha having been a collector for decades, you know, through the 70s and, and 1980s, I remember quite well how it was so difficult to get complete runs of series. 
one of the reasons that people traded in the hobby was there may be some discs from this one station and it had had these and then oh somebody else found another episode of suspense at this station and then they they would have to get together now that i'm transferring a lot of the tapes that those collectors had i'm i'm realizing there's lots of uh, there's lots of rumble there's lots of hum there's lots of noise because they didn't have the tools that we have today nor did they have access to discs that were uh, pristine looking at it for, as the collector in 1970 or 1980s that you could say you can get this entire series and not have to hunt around and not have to worry about who has a broken tape recorder who's whose tape is all, off speed or fast or somebody didn't know how to transfer a disc i mean here it is you're just handing it to them and it is really really amazing that this could be done now i, I just want to get on to, to one topic because i know some of the older collectors don't necessarily have an understanding of your role in the hobby you were a collector and you still are a collector sure yeah and, still and you acted in recreations at the friends of old time radio convention <laughs> yeah i remember standing next to willard waterman i played leroy um along with shirley mitchell in a in a reenactment i did one with lon clark i was a bad guy and all the bad guys you know they all talk like this you know so i talked like that with lon clark yeah and um you know was i went to all so many of those conventions met so many people jackson back i remember jackson back showed me his afra card at the time right. and it was for two yes so he was a key person in the structure uh, of the radio business yeah he was, and, and he uh, loved fans and he loved the convention yeah and then raymond edward johnson i remember they brought yeah. him in on a bed but yeah. his voice was still so powerful and uh, very f fond memories of going to those conventions in yeah. both cincinnati and and uh new jersey now, now you mentioned jackson beck jackson beck was yeah. a really interesting person and in the end a pussycat who helped uh, the convention gets so many guests who, just yeah. to get the adulation and the recognition. But in the beginning, Jackson Beck did not like our hobby. He didn't yeah. understand the hobby. Right. I have a tape of him in 1972 at one of the even earlier conventions that said, you guys can't do this. And then a bunch of collectors took him aside and said, Jack, no, it's not like what, what you're thinking. We're trying to preserve this. We're, we're fans. Sure. We're sure. trying to work on this. And then he sent what should be a famous letter, which says... We love you collectors. You can go and collect. You can share recordings. You can get reimbursed for your time for, for doing these kinds of recordings. We love you. Just don't be commercial and don't, don't sell to radio stations. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that was basically the umbrella that the hobby operated on. As you came to grow your Radio Spirits business, you started to acquire rights to things so that you could broaden the base of the hobby commercially. Well, what happened to me was, you know, I love these shows so much. And I had, you know, collected cassettes and even eight track tapes from Radio Yesteryear and Radiola and Radio, radio Reruns. And um, when I got into college, there was a rate, you know, it was a broadcast major and there was a radio station. And I thought, now yeah, I'll play some of these shows on the radio. And it was a 10 watt radio station. And I got a cease and desist from Noel Blank, Mel Blank's son. I played a Mel Blanc's fix and shop. How in the heck 10 watt radio station in Chicago, how I ever found out about it. That's when I first realized that, oh, I didn't, I had no idea that these shows had, you know, rights or copyrights. And then I learned about Charles Michelson. Mm -hmm. He was probably one of the, the big syndicators of the seventies, even earlier. I learned pretty quickly that the only way to, if I wanted to be on the radio, and that was really my goal was to be on the radio playing these shows. I had to get right. So I, I looked at what was available. I licensed Life of Riley and oh, so many, you know, so many shows back then. Tales of the Texas Rangers and and all, uh, turns all, it. all through that time, you were still a collector. You were in, okay. in trading groups and like and, and, and working sure. with other collectors and, and all. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and, like Ken Paletic and Terry Solomonson and, you know, and Jerry Hendages and all those right. people. Yeah. The commercial side of, of your life was different than the collecting side, and you always kept that separate. That wasn't really my my idea. What happened was I was on Eastern Airlines. I'd never really mm -hmm. even thought about selling radio shows. I was on Eastern Airlines through a company called Music in the Air. John Doremus owned the company, and he hired me to do a show for Eastern Airlines, and then it ended up going on Delta and a few other companies. And I had some rights and I only played the shows that I had rights to. And then the 
senior vice president of CBS radio heard me on a flight, contacted me and said, look, we have a show called the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, and it's going away at the end of the year. And we're going to have a whole an hour a night, Monday through Friday, in the CBS radio network, 88 owned and owned stations across the country. I want to plug this kind of a show in. Would you want to do it? I said, of course. And he said, well, we're CBS, so we'll license you all of our shows, all of the, you know, Gunsmoke, Have Gun, Will Travel, Suspense, Escape, you know, all these shows that they own, that CBS own. They said, but we want you to make money. We want you to make money for us. We want you to not only air them, but we want you to sell them Mm -hmm. and pay us a royalty. And that's how I got into the business. The show was called When Radio Was. You're not involved in that anymore because Radio Spirits was a business that attracted a buyer in 1998 and you sold that business and have not been involved in it any time since. Correct. They were still using your likeness because you were the founder. Right? So <laughs> a lot of people attribute things that they did, which was much different style of business than you had. And, yeah. And some people think that you may have gotten some collectors in trouble with some of the shows that they were collecting, but you weren't involved in any of that because you weren't at that business any longer. Right. I sold the company in 1998. I think I transitioned for about six months to a year. In that time, I went uh, for them and acquired Medicom and then David Golden's company and just put it all under an umbrella. And then I left the company and I started my company right. that was producing the Twilight Zone radio dramas. But they did right. use my name and likeness, my email and all that kind of stuff as the sort of the face of the company. There are certain things that happened with that company and collectors that you were not involved in. You're still a collector and you would not have done that if, if you were there. I had a five-year non-compete. I waited a lot longer than five years, but then I got back into broadcasting classic radio. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I today have probably twice as many rights to shows from about 2008 until now. I've acquired more than double the shows that I had, the rights to shows that I had then. And now when you add the Ziv library, it may be triple the amount of shows yeah. that I have under license today. And I've right. never sent a cease and desist to anyone in all that time. Right. I just, just wanted to clear that up for some of the older collectors who may uh, who may misattribute what, what happened at that time. Because in the end, you were still a fan. I listen to classic radio shows every single day of my life. I love it. I love them. Tell us about Bold Venture and, and, and how this is going. When, well, when does the Kickstarter end? It ends yeah. November 21st. So we have about 30 plus days. All right. We're recording on October 13th. So we have till November 21st. If we don't hit our goal, it will not be released. I don't have a plan B at this point. I don't know what we would do. It's, it is way too expensive to do. I cannot afford to transfer 10,000 discs. <laughs> so uh-huh. I thought we'd start with Bold Venture. Which is the big headliner in the whole Zoom yeah. library. I mean, it's... It, because of its history and also because of its stars. Right. And it's manageable. It's 78 shows. Hopefully people will support it, get these, preserve the series for generations to come and not just preserve the series, but I'm talking about in pristine quality, using someone that has the talents and the equipment that Doug has someone like Doug, who will has, you know, tender, loving care, loves these shows as much as any of us do. He's going to make sure that the quality is the best that can possibly come off each disc. And then we're going to move on to, as I say, Boston Blackie. That's a longer series. That's 218 episodes. But it's from episode one of Dick Kalmar all the way to episode 218 with Dick Kalmar. Mm -hmm. And I think about 70 of those episodes aren't in circulation. So out of the 150 or so that are in circulation, there's maybe 30 that are decent quality. The rest are right. pretty bad. Doug, you and I have known each other, what, it's about 12 years now, 13 years. Oh, who's counting, Joe? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to use different styli for these for discs to get around problems. You you have to learn how to clean them because, because dirt settles within, uh, within the grooves of the records. Then there might be some kind of surface problems of, of the transcriptions that you've you've learned how to to deal with. And then, of course, speed issues. Now, I, I don't think that this is the case with the, the syndicated discs, but I know with the studio transcriptions, 
Transcription turntables were not always on speed. Sometimes you have to correct for that either when you're recording or after you're recording. So there, there's lots of problems that you can have with these. These have been relatively problem free, right? Correct. They're they're absolutely a joy to work with. It's it's so different from what I've been used to. I've been transferring discs for I don't know how many years. Um, and there's also an equipment investment that you've made over the years to find the uh, turntables that don't have rumble, that have the right tone arm lengths, that, that you can make various adjustments to make sure that you can accommodate various differences from disc to disc. These transcription discs are big 16-inch records, and they could only accommodate 15 minutes on each side. So each program required two sides of a transcription disc. Carl, we have to wrap this up. What else do you have to say to everyone about the project? I hope people will go to the Kickstarter and support this preservation effort. You know, Frederick Ziv was quite a prolific producer, and some of the best radio shows on the planet were, are in this library here, sitting in temperature-controlled storage, waiting to be transferred. I'm honored and lucky enough to have licensed this entire library. It is a pretty monumental effort. It's kind of like a unicorn. I can't even believe that these shows in complete runs exist in, in perfect shape of these discs. And I'm really honored to know Doug, who's one of the best in the business at transferring these shows and is going to care for them to the utmost. We hope you will go to Kickstarter and support this uh, Bold Venture project, because if we can get through Bold Venture, we're going to go to Boston Blackie next. I think probably after that, it's I was a communist for the FBI, then maybe Philo Vance or Favorite Story. We want to get through it all. <laughs> all you got to do is search Bold Venture kickstarter and you'll be taken right to the site okay so the key date for us to remember is what november 21st yeah november the 21st. last day of the kickstarter well carl thank you very very much doug thank you very much and we appreciate the hard work you're doing in transferring all of these recordings thank you very much joe for thank having me thank you joe thank you for all you do in this hobby too really appreciate you thank you thank you